This dog, Tango, is 14 years old. You know, he's struggling. I mean, look at him. He's got cataracts. I'm too old for this. And yet, everyone who sees Tango says that's a good dog. When we look at ourselves and our own lives, we don't hold ourselves to the same standard as this dog. We seem to need more, right? We need to be great. We need to perform. How do I stand out? What makes me me? What is the only thing I can do that no one else can do? These are the kind of questions Socrates asked. Socrates, if you don't know, was just this weird real deal of a guy. He basically was poor as hell and he would walk around the public square in Athens with the movers and shakers, the, the diplomats, the warriors. He would just ask them annoying questions. By some strike of God or something, he became sort of famous. And um, when we look back at that period, I'm, I always find it ironic that the weird homeless looking guy who was walking around asking people questions is the one we remember and we can't really name any of the Greek leaders, Archimedes or something. But we all know Socrates and Plato. Plato was the first one I heard about. When I was a kid, I thought it was spelled Play-Doh. Here, you get back in the sun, my boy. You've served your example. It's so interesting because he doesn't function the way a dog should and yet I've made so many friends through him. And when I think about what I need right now the most, it's meeting new people and making friends. So Tango, even though he's kind of pathetic in a lot of ways, is serving the deepest purpose I could ask him to serve right now. <clears throat> Just gets you reevaluating. The golden mean, to be rich or poor is not good. If you guys want some baseline Greek understanding, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, they all agreed that there's no one extreme that we should be striving for. You shouldn't be the highest achiever and you shouldn't be the biggest dropout. Every time they found a virtue somewhere in the middle, they called that the golden mean. So they give an example of, you know, someone's performance when they get too good, like Michael Jackson or George Lucas, when they've had too much success, they seem to get worse at their craft, which is art. I may have gone too far in a few places. Um, yeah. And yet if they have no success at all, they don't have opportunities to develop the craft. The original Star Wars was plagued with problems. Nothing worked right. Things were rushed, I guess, but it ended up being a great movie. They're somewhere in the middle. This is a very reassuring idea because extremes are what's marketed to us in our culture. You might go fly in one direction of buying everything and then denounce all your possessions and move into a van the next month like Tom Green just did. Another day, another day on the road. Be safe, everyone. Awesome. Larry says hi, too. Right, Larry? We're constantly flying back and forth. These guys are like, there's a golden mean there. How do you find it? What direction is it a little more difficult for you to push in right now? That's how fear becomes the compass. Cool Greek idea. All right, we got Plato here. We we're about 428 BC. We got Glaucon, his brother, Edamantus. I don't know if we need all these guys. They have funny names though. So they had just exited Periclean democracy. Pericles who was sort of regarded as a leader who led from a very rational place. And then the people basically demanded a return to war. I mean, he denounced war. He sort of secured the city square, created a lot of programs for people to create commerce. And Greece was like, nah, we, we want a war. We want a perpetual war. Plato, Socrates, these guys are asking, can there be a righteous leader? Do you, can you have a society without warfare? Um, and Pericles was kind of an attempt that did not quite pop off. So what follows is these guys have a very grounded, pragmatic understanding of what a society takes. And yet they live in the lofty world of what could be. What would be a utopian society? Let's just jump into the philosophy here. It is better to suffer wrong than to do it. Better to ch be chastised for wrongdoing than to escape punishment. There is an art to living, analogous to a craftsman's knowledge and consequent ability to perform a proposed end. This is where it gets interesting. Okay, so for Socrates, he saw human beings as like a tool or an animal. There's one function that only a human being can do that no other animal can do. You might say a beaver's function is to build a dam. You might say, you know, this dog's function is to check a perimeter. A human being's function is reason. Um, meaning we can look at a lot of different things 
and entertain them in our heads and regard a best path forward. His point was, if you're the only thing that can do a thing, maybe you ought to do it to the highest of your ability. And that's what he called happiness, pursuing the virtues of what only human beings can pursue at the highest level seems to be happiness. Um, because in some way in ancient Greece, functioning and being happy were intertwined. Watch the cord, buddy. But now we can kind of imagine just kind of chilling out and uh, not functioning and hoping that we'll be happy. That's why a lot of us are confused. I just want to rest at the end of the day and sort of receive life. But if you're not functioning, you can't really be happy. And just like a beaver that wasn't very good at cutting wood with its ass or whatever beavers do, would probably feel pretty sad. So they engage with the idea that right might be different for our friends and our enemies. And uh, Socrates comes back with, well, what, would a doctor ever behave that way? You know, would a doctor say, I'm gonna use my healing powers only to heal the people that I determine are my friends. And how would he do that? Because a doctor wouldn't be the best person at delineating who was right and wrong. So what a doctor does is simply fulfills the doctor function broadly and widely without determining who deserves it and who doesn't. We need a doctor, ma'am. Oh my God! because that is the way to fulfill his highest function as a doctor. And he lets other people think about who deserves it and who, who doesn't. I think when I get confused, I've been screwed over by somebody, you always wonder, do I have to win? You know, do I have to, if I wanna be an artist, for example, do I also have to be a debt collector? Do I have to be a great lawyer? Or can I just focus on being an artist? Socrates advocates for focusing on what you can do that no one else can do. And don't try to be an expert at anything else. Just like the doctor, not determining who he should operate on, but just operating. That feels not only reassuring, but when you try it, cool things start happening. You know, that doctor might say, this person's my enemy, they're from another country that we're at war with. Heal that person, and then they become some Nazi doctor that helps us, you know, create new technology. So you never, you never know just far and wide just like this dog i don't i don't say what dog i can take care of I'll, i take the worst and the best and the worst dogs teach me the most turning the other cheek so cool to read this stuff because it's like this is before jesus you're seeing how they worshiped gods how they created democracy before america this is america land of freedom and law you have nothing on me oh i got a lot of shit on you all of the kernels that would go on and be directly studied for those worldviews. And don't think, you know, Jesus just came down from the mount and wasn't thinking about these Greek principles. All of these ideas were influencing each other. Hindu ideas were making it over to ancient Greece. I was always fascinated in philosophy that the same questions the Hindus asked, the Greeks asked. How, like, what, did the Silk Road <laughs> send them? When people ask the same questions, and Buddhism comes to the same conclusions that Socrates came to in a democracy, you gotta think, there might be something there. So here he gets into negative reinforcement. So a lot of these guys, a lot of our knee-jerk reaction is like, we must punish those who are not righteous and we must reward those who are. And kind of like his broad stroke with the doctor of just rewarding everyone, he just asks the question like, what good does punishment do? Like. Um, doesn't harming a horse or a dog make it a worse horse or dog? So that each will be a less perfect creature in its own special way? And doing the harm as a human, you know, taking care of animals, I've seen this negative versus positive reinforcement. Doing a harm to a dog going, no, sitting down, you know, you get that angry voice, stop, no. And you like do that Caesar Milan, like fake bite. And you just feel like an asshole. And the dog feels like an asshole for you. And his point is like, are we sure that's working? Why are we just knee-jerk punishing everything around us? When you ask these questions about what makes something better or more virtuous versus not, you can see how you can just let go of a lot of stuff. Laying a problem down and making sort of a ritualistic I don't give a fuck to it seems to solve it about half the time. It's remarkable. I got this like super chill yoga class going on over here. Hope I'm not disturbing them. God. Gorgeous human beings. So you might go to a yoga class, by the way, because 
in yoga class, no one judges you. So it's like a nice hour of everyone's going to be nice to you. And so no one's making the dog worse, as Socrates says. So Thrasymachus comes back with the social Darwinism. We see the first incarnation of this idea of social Darwinism. Right and wrong is relative, some of these people would say. The winners are the ones who are right. Or, or today, people might say the losers are the ones who are right. The Howard Zinn's untold history of the United States, you might say, that's the real truth. Um, Socrates says, none of that matters. You know, there's only what we can determine is true through rigorous conversation, and it doesn't change. That's the nice thing. Justice is justice is justice, no matter who's the winner and who's the loser. So this social Darwinism idea is kind of challenged. This is where Socrates makes the case that the strong can't serve the strong because a craftsman, in order to be a good craftsman, is always serving someone who's a weaker craftsman. If you're building things, you're serving people who don't have knowledge of building. If you're a doctor, you're serving people who are lacking health. In a fundamental way, you can't be a great doctor unless you're constantly serving things that are weaker than you. So the idea that a politician would not serve the weakest in the community, the people who are lacking political power the most, would be absurd. If you're wondering on who to reward in your life, you might start with the people who are weakest in the places where you are strongest. Because according to Socrates, it's not gonna be a waste of time, it's not gonna be charity. That's developing your greatness. What's up, Evan? Talking about Socrates in the morning. Ripped off the front and the back on accident. I read the hell out of these books, you know? That's how you know you're doing it. But I took this as basically what's good for the goose is good for the gander. What's good for any element of our society is good for every element of our society. <clears throat> I'm trying to keep my voice down so these people can achieve enlightenment. So. Plato throws down the gauntlet here. The cool thing is, we're like so far into this book, we don't even know really what Plato and Socrates believe because we're engaging with everybody else's viewpoints. Putting the dialogue in here, they're actually showing you how to engage in conversation. It's not just what they're saying, it's how they're saying it. And so when Thrasymachus comes up and he's like, Socrates, show me might does not make right, blah, blah, blah. And Socrates is like, whoa, 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 for sure you would kick my ass but let's see if you're smart too. And then he crushes him in that way. You know, they're showing you how to deal with somebody who's coming at you with, with negative, powerful negative energy. Be humble, flatter them in a way that's true. Perhaps you, person who's yelling at me or bringing me um, all your pain, perhaps you have some information that I don't have. Um, just that humility allowed Socrates to live this ridiculous life um, asking these forbidden questions, you know, non-religious questions, questions about whether even democracy itself was a good thing. I mean, he was asking insane questions and they killed him for it, but he lived until the end of his life because not only did he know what to say, but he knew how to say it. And that's where the Socratic method comes from, all based on questions, questioning, the, your basic concepts until you realize, oh wow, I have a lot of contradictions there and actually I just found some cool ideas that I'd never considered. That's his gambit and Plato drops finally one of those ideas, his belief that justice is more profitable than injustice for the individual who practices it. Show me the money. And this is like the fundamental question. If you do right. He's wrong. It don't take much strength to pull a trigger, but try and get up every morning, day after day, and work for a living. Let's see him try that. If you never cut corners, if you only focus on the virtue of whatever it is that you can do that no one else can do, will you live a profitable life too? You know, maybe it's not just good enough for most people to live a happy life. Perhaps they want to know that they can create some power with that. Plato just says right here, I believe you can. But they're not just going to tell you why. You know, this, this book is discovering that truth. So as you're, as you're reading it, you're sort of discovering it with these people. I'm going to end it there. Please subscribe and follow me at DevonPG on Instagram if you want to see these readings live, interact, hang out, all that good stuff.